Three words, maybe four today. Are you ready? There'll be a quiz afterwards. Rebellion. Deliverance. Hope and justice. As of Black Friday, it's on. It's on. How many of you know why we call it Black Friday? As opposed to pink, green, red? Why? I'm, 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 going, to, I'm going to say that, uh, that you're probably right. Um, I'm probably thinking that there were many sold on many Fridays. Uh, that one is probably not the answer I was looking for. However, it's probably leg legitimate. Yes, there's one at the back. Why do we call it Black Friday? The merchants of Calcutta, we call it Black. This man is a teacher. Listen carefully. As you go to say, yes, Paul. Are you hearing this? As you went willy-nilly into the mall on Black Friday, the shopkeepers were all going, black, black, I want black. 75% of all the sales in the stores happened between Black Friday and December 31st. Are you hearing me, church? No, you're in shock. You're saying, oh, they got me. Why don't I wait until the after Christmas sales? They don't want to hear that. I talked to a lady this year who said that the Amazon effect has caused the loss to retailers of billions, over $200 billion last year because you guys bought too much and then you sent it back. Actually, she was talking on a TED Talk, and she was saying, you know what, we need another way of doing this, because a lot of those things that you send back end up in the landfill. Because the companies who sent them to you in the first place do not have place to store them. So she's thinking of coming up with a new idea of you being able to send the gift on to the next person and receive your money back from that person who will then use the item and not send it to the landfill. Are you thinking that this might actually be a great idea? Well, they did on TED Talks. You thought, why on earth are we talking about Black Friday when the four words are rebellion, deliverance, hope, and justice? Justice. Because you see, Zechariah is talking about a time when there was rebellion in the land and the people had paid the price. Because of their rebellion, they had left their home, they had been taken by, into captivity, and they were now spending 70 years in captivity. Recent meetings with Sean Boonster revealed to me something I maybe had never thought before, and that was that those 70 years gave the land in Israel the seven years rest. Do you remember that? How in God's economy, every seven years, you were supposed to quit work and have what we all know and enjoy and wish we had every month or year called a sabbatical. Heard that word? We still use that word. Well, there was supposed to be a sabbatical every seven years in the calendar of Israel, but they never did it. So God sends them off to Babylon, and they stay there for 70 years. 70 because there were 70 one-year periods that they had not celebrated in the 490 years that they had had to get ready for the Messiah. So he very graciously gives them another 490 years. So you can, you can see this prophecy in Daniel. It's very interesting, but it was an interesting correlation for me to hear that those 70 years that the Israelites spent in Babylon were so that they could give the land a rest. A rest from what? A rest from their use, a rest from their need. And they could just depend on God. 
If I could say only one thing to you this season and this season would be the only season you ever had in your life, it would be if you can choose today to depend on God, He will save you. He will protect you. He will deliver you. The fact is that they rebelled. The fact is that we have been part of the global rebellion that is going on against the God of the universe. So our first word today is rebellion. But along comes a plan, and we're told that this plan was put into place, was put into place before the world began. Now, why that is told to us, I don't know, but the fact is that there is a plan, and it is a plan to deliver us. And in fact, this wonderful song that that you sang so beautifully, Mary, did you know? Did you know that this baby is nicknamed by Pastor Stevenson as the plan? That's his nickname. Did you know? Jesus is the plan of deliverance for the entire human race. And here he is in Mary's arms in in a stable because there was no room for them. Yes, yes, Inga was right. We are part of a a consortium of churches, an organization here in, in Santa Clarita called Family Promise where we house homeless children and their families for a week at a time. We share this with other churches in the area and other synagogues. There's a lot of people who are involved in this. We are hoping that there will be even more people involved in this because no, the homeless problem in L.A. is not going away. It is getting worse. And so here in Christmas time, we are grateful for the opportunity to host and to house some people who would not otherwise have a roof over their heads just like Joseph and Mary. Yes, it's inconvenient. Yes, we... We have to make room. And maybe that's how the innkeeper felt that night. As the deliverer was delivered into the hands of his mother after his being in her tummy. It's just just Mary and Joseph. So I guess Joseph had to play midwife that night. And he, he delivers his son into his mother's hands knowing full well that this is not his Son, you know, we know this, but still it was a birth. There was pain, there was agony, there was crying, and then there was joy. Jesus took his first breaths as Mary lays him in the feed trough. Did you know? Mary, did you know? Could you imagine the, the magnitude of what this plan would encompass. That's why the song is so passionate. That's why the song is, is asking this question, because it's asking it of all of us. Did we know, Adventists? It's lovely to be called an Adventist at this time of the year, isn't it? Advent, the coming. At this time of the year, when when the world's attention is is drawn towards the first advent of this Messiah, this Deliverer, we should should be saying, yes, yes, yes. And and, and the same Jesus who came in this manner is is going to come again in this. Don't Don't you get excited that could it be that 2019 would be the year? The old English goes like this. In the year of our Lord. That's a hopeful statement. It's a hopeful statement saying, I hope this is the year. Not just that grandpa dies and the next thing he sees is Jesus coming. You know how we Adventists teach that. You know. Oh yes, well, it it, it was 2019 and grandpa died and the next thing he knows is Jesus coming. So it was the year for him. No, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a yearning. I'm talking about a a desire in each one of our hearts that he would come again for real. I think that's, that's what we can have in our hearts. It's what was in the hearts of so many people the first time he came. 
They needed a deliverer. They needed a deliverer. But unfortunately, they believed that they needed deliverance just from the Romans and that it would just be the Israelites. That's why Nicodemus' mind was blown when Jesus says to him, Nicodemus, I have come for everyone. Aren't we glad of that? I, I, don't, I don't believe I haven't done the, any of those heritage uh, things. I haven't wanted to uh, send any money to any organization that might misuse my information. But, um, you know, I don't believe I have a shred of Israelite blood in me. Others might disagree. When it comes to uh, finances, I, I can be rather, you know, interested in how they go. But the fact is that if, if, if you are not Israelite in your DNA, all that the people of Israel back in the time of Jesus' first advent would have to say to you is, ha, sucks for you. You're not an Israelite. You must be a, a goy. You must be a Gentile. And therefore, this Messiah is not coming for you. He's coming for us. I am so glad to stand before you to say that Jesus says to Nicodemus that night, I have come for everybody. And I'm glad to say that we still are saying to the world as an Adventist church, Jesus is coming back for everybody. Red and yellow, black and white. It doesn't matter what kind of person you are. Okay, I'm going to be just as inclusive as ever. If you have human DNA, it was given to you by God and he is interested in changing it in the twinkling of an eye, he says, and having you live in his presence face to face forever. Now, I don't know about you, but that's good news. Because as I get older, I'm realizing that I ain't the spring chicken I used to be. You know what I'm saying? I can't jump as high. I can't run as fast. I can't just get up in the morning and go, oh, I feel great. Oh, no. Oh, no. I'm getting old. And I'm thinking, if this is all there is, God, this is not enough. I need eternity. And I didn't even get one amen from the old people. What do you say? I mean, come on. I mean, I, there's nobody out here that feels the same way that I do this morning. I mean, come on. Those of you who have passed 70 years of age, you know that just yesterday you were 15. <laughs> just yesterday. You guys who think you're old? Because, yeah, thank you, thank you. Who looked up here at all the little kids and said, I'm really a lot older than them. That was two nanoseconds ago. I get to see some of the kids who come to church and, and, and when I don't see them for a few weeks and then I see them again... They're doing things they weren't doing the last time I saw them. And it just happened in two weeks. So this, this feeling that now is the time, that now is this time that we need a deliverer is not just the way that people felt when Jesus came the first time. It should be the way that we feel now. We need a deliverer. So the first word is rebellion. The second word is deliverance. The third word is hope. You see, because the story that we celebrate at this time of the year is giving us hope. Those of us who have accepted it, who have put it into our hearts, and we believe that it was the God of heaven, the creator God who made the whole world, who, who is the one who came the first time, and, and that whole mystery of, of how he cloaks his divinity in humanity and, and, and gets born to, to a woman in the same way that every human being is born and then goes on to do this amazing ministry and then dies of his own accord on the cross. Don't ever think that the Romans killed Jesus. Don't ever think that the Jews killed Jesus. Don't ever think that you killed Jesus. Remember what he said. I will lay down my life. And I will pick it up again. 
Don't ever forget that. The disciples forgot that. And so when they looked and they saw that Roman centurion come up to Jesus to break his legs, because that's what he'd done to the two thieves already so that they would die quicker. Sorry, that's a bit PG-13. Anyway, um, he was already dead. He was already dead, and because he was already dead, he breaks out his spear, because Jesus is high up on that tree, he breaks out that spear and spears him in the side just to make sure he's dead, just to make sure he's not faking. And yep, Luke tells us, blood and water flow out. Yep, he was dead of a broken heart. On his own terms... In his own power, the Son of God lays down his life and provides deliverance for us. My friends, this is the basis of our hope. And as the song said, as the scripture said today, in your hearing, because he did this, we as a human race can have hope. It's the first word of Advent. We follow this this tradition here in this local church where we have the four words of Advent. And so if you come again next week, you'll hear the next word. But hope is that word that we live by. Hope is the word that Wayne Hooper had in his mind when he wrote that song that now describes Adventism. We have this hope that burns within our hearts. Hope of the coming of the Lord. It's the essence. It's the essence of being an Adventist. Being a person who looks forward now. Not only looks back as all the rest of the world is doing now. But looks forward to the same Jesus who came in like manner and will come back in like manner. No, he's not going to come as a baby in a, in a, in a, in a feed trough again. He is going to come in the clouds of glory. That's what those two angels said to the disciples, right? As they're looking up and watching him go and going, no, no, don't go away. They comfort them by saying, he's going to be back. He's going to be back. So we come to our text today. And what comes to my mind when I read this text in Zechariah is the fact that Zechariah is hearing from God and God is, 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 in some respects, pronouncing judgment upon the church. You want to worship me, church? You want to you ask me in the midst of your captivity, in the midst of you being in Babylon for these 70 years, you're going to ask me whether or not you should fast in the fifth month and the seventh month? Do you really think that you were doing that for me, he says? No, not at all. You weren't doing that for me. You were doing that for you. See where Black Friday comes in here? Are we more interested in being uh, Adventists who are looking forward to the advent of the shopping season? Or the season in which we praise The God who gives every part of humanity its power, its strength, its ability to be and have being. Empty ritual, my friends. Empty ritual. Wow, now we're awake. (laughs) Empty ritual is what God is talking about. He's saying, fasting, you were doing that for yourselves. Are you sure you think that that's what I want, he says? This is what he says. I'm going I'm to do it in, in the hearing of your voice again. The word of the Lord came to Zechariah. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Administer true justice. Show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the alien or the poor. In your hearts, 
In your hearts, do not think evil of each other. I can't help thinking of Matthew 25, where Jesus tells the story of the sheep and the goats. And what does he put on the list of what I call the greatest exam ever of humanity? What's on the list? Did you study your lesson seven times this week? Did you not curse this week? No. What's on the list is, did you see a person in need and did you help them? In the name of the Father of Lights, did you take some of the riches that you had received from him generously? I mean, he did send us the sun again today, right? Have you ever thought about how generous that is? What if he didn't send the sun tomorrow? What if the world stopped spinning and we were on the dark side of the earth forever? I guess we'd all move to Asia to be in the sun. But he sent the sun again today. He is so generous with us, my friends. And when we see others in need, he is basically saying, if you are my children, if you have my spirit in you and it is motivating you, you will be generous in the same way as I am generous with you. True, true justice. The evidence, the evidence of membership in the family of God is that you share his DNA. You do what he does. You think like he thinks. And in every situation in life, in this world, you act like he would act because you are his child. I think that the sheep couldn't help themselves. And that the goats had determined that they were only interested in helping God. Anyone else? Oh, forget it. Remember how they say it? Oh, if we'd only seen you, Jesus! Of course we would have given you clothes and given you water and given you food. Of course if we'd seen you. So Jesus says those words that are so amazing and that's, that just fly by us so many times, especially at this time in the year when we're thinking it's Black Friday. I can't wait for the sales. I wonder what Jesus would do, what kind of shopping he would do on that day. Maybe he did. Maybe there was a Black Friday back in his day. I don't know. But I'm saying this, that I believe that when he saw people who needed food, he gave them his food. When he saw people in need, and I'm going to say there are <coughs> micro versions of this where we see people in need that you know, we, we are so judgmental of many times. I know I am. And then there are macro versions where we, we could look at, at debtor nations in this world that will never ever be able to pay the International Monetary Fund back. Ever. So when Bono says, maybe we should let them off. Maybe we should forgive them their debts so that they can come back into the circle of reality in this world. That's macro. That's macro. Okay? And there are some countries who are already beginning to practice this in their own country. Lithuania has forgiven millions of dollars in debt in order to restart their economy. I know that some of you Bible scholars know what the word jubilee means, but I want you economists to be watching out for it this year in 2019 because I think you're going to hear it in the Wall Street Journal. There's more and more talk about a jubilee maybe right here in the United States where we would actually forgive debts. 
Look at these children that we have, these beautiful children that we have here today. Do you realize that the third biggest debt in the United States is student loans? What are we going to do about that? America? What are we going to do about it? Okay? Adventist education doesn't come cheap. It's a commitment. We're committed to it in this church. I'm committed to it as a pastor in the Seventh-day Adventist church, and I believe that it makes a difference for eternity. If I did not believe that, I could not support it. It makes a difference in people's lives for eternity, not just for now. But it costs something. It has to take an investment. I wonder how many people were thinking about GAA on Black Friday. Maybe we could make that the new tradition. Don't go to the mall. Go to GAA and give them the check you would have spent at the mall. Oh, man, listen to this. They're happy about this. Yeah, you're happy? You didn't need, you didn't need that ugly sweater anyway, did you? A long time ago, there was a rebellion. And here we are, folks. This world is still in rebellion against God. And there are vicious, wicked things that are happening every day. So we still need a deliverer. Amen? Amen. And because we know that he is real, he has changed lives, and that he is coming, we have hope. In the meantime, before we visualize him, he has asked us to administer true justice. To love mercy and to do justice. That's what Micah says. This Christmas season, I hope that your hope is the same as my hope and that his name is Jesus. Amen.